So like I said, good morning um, to all of you guys. Thank you for being a part of Finding Hope, an interview with survivors of suicide loss. Um, obviously, we know that this is a very challenging topic to discuss and talk about. And so we want to be very sensitive to that this morning. As you saw in my email, safety is a priority to us today. And so knowing that we are going to be sharing some potentially emotional stories and things that could be hard, maybe remind you of your own personal stories or things that you have gone through. We want to be sensitive to that. So one of the, the things that we would ask, and as much as it is possible, if you could keep your camera on just to make sure that you guys are safe today. One of my roles in the background today is just going to be making sure that everybody seems to be responding okay to the things we're talking about. Um, if at any point I private message you and just say, hey, are you doing okay? That is not a personal thing. That is a, um, a me trying to care for you and make sure that you are, are okay. So um, maybe doing that here and there throughout the presentation, but also if at any point you decide that this is too much or it's hard for you to keep your camera on, we also don't want you to feel like you can't have your camera on today. So um, do whatever is necessary to take care of yourself. But one of the things that I say in a lot of the presentations that I do virtually is just to be a person of integrity, um, meaning that if you need help, be willing to speak up, be willing to say something. If you're gonna turn your camera off today, just be willing to reach out at any point if you feel that this is hard for you. Um, so just I want to remind you guys also one of the things that helps me take attendance because we want to make sure that you guys are accounted for today. If you would go to the chat box, you guys should see the chat box on your screen. If you'll go to the chat box and put your name in the chat and particularly the name that you registered with. I know sometimes you might go by a different name, but if you registered with a specific name, try to put that name down so that we can make sure that you are accounted for and present today. Um, so with that said, I am going to have Michaela do a brief reading for us today. I will introduce to you guys Michaela Donovan. She is interning with the Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network. Um, she's going to be doing a brief reading today. Before she does that, I do want to point out a couple of other things that I failed to mention. Number one is if you guys are um, able to, there should be a box in the top right side of your screen. If you're using a computer, it's going to say view in the top right. If you click view and use speaker view instead of gallery view, I don't know how it looks on your end right now. But if you've got it set up in gallery view, then you're going to see a bunch of little bitty tiny thumbnail videos. One way to help you actually see a full screen version of the video of the person that's talking is to go to the speaker view. So you'll have kind of videos popping in and out here and there of individuals that will be speaking today. So go ahead and switch that to speaker view if you have not already done so. And then we will hand it over to Michaela. And remember, keep your mics muted. If you are joining us today, be sure to try to keep your mics muted so that we don't have any feedback noise. So Michaela, you can go ahead and do the reading of the remembrance candles that we have today. Sure. So I am going to do this reading and Lindsay's gonna light the candles as we go through it. We light these five candles in honor of our loved ones. One candle for our grief, one candle for our courage, one candle for our memories, one candle for our love, and one candle for our hope. The first candle we light in your memory represents our grief. The pain of losing you is as, 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 is as intense as our love for you. The second candle we light in your memory represents the courage to confront our sorrow, to comfort each other, and to change our lives. The third candle we light in your memory reminds us of the times we laughed, 
the times we cried, the times we were angry towards each other, the silly things you did, and the caring and joy you gave us. The fourth candle we light under your memory is for our love. As we share this day of remembrance, we light this candle that your light may always shine. And the fifth candle we light in remembrance is for hope, the hope that you'll live on through us, the hope that you'll never be erased from our memory and that your life will continue to make a difference in the world. So we are gonna keep the candles on throughout the, the rest of the event, right? Is the plan and then we will extinguish them at the end. So now we're going to move on to having our panelists share their stories. So we're gonna have each person share their story and then we'll do some questions after that just for everybody to answer. So we're gonna start with Emily Hager. Uh, she is a TSPN staff member um, so, uh, Emily, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Good morning. I just want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Emily Hager, and as Michaela had mentioned, um, I have joined Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network as the East Regional Director. And my story starts in 2013, where my mother... Um, lost her life to breast cancer. She lost a very intense and rigorous battle to breast cancer that ultimately led to me and my family watching her deteriorate um, before our eyes. And that was kind of the beginning of my struggles. After I lost my mom, um, my grandmother passed away. Um, she quit taking care of herself and um, eventually ended up in the hospital herself and passed away shortly afterwards. Um, these two losses to me were extremely difficult because I relied so much on um, my mother and my grandmother. Um, my grandmother raised me apart from my mom <clears throat> and this led me to a place where I was um, drinking heavily every night. Um, I had a very high tolerance to alcohol. And I also at the time was married um, to Kevin and, I, and we had a son together. Um, and my life just started taking this downward spiral where I was getting very reckless. I was partying. It was, it was very difficult on me, but it was even more so difficult on Kevin because he was left in this place where um, he had to not only work, but was also providing for our son who was two years old. And I was physically there, but was not emotionally there or oftentimes wasn't mentally there because I was always intoxicated. Um, and I, I wasn't, I wasn't there as support for Kevin, um, when he needed it, um, and it led him to a place over time to where he felt hopeless and lost and he took his life. Um, after that, I went and drank more. Every night I was gone until three o'clock in the morning. Um, I immediately started dating someone. Uh, it was my form of escape. I had so much anger towards him because I felt like he didn't, he wasn't there for me when I needed to be, when I needed someone, I felt abandoned. Like he had um, left me with everything that I had experienced. He left me and I, it, it was just like this emptiness. So uh, mind you, at this point, I've now lost three of the people that were closest to me in my life and um, I was dull on the inside. I had no feeling, um, it, it was like my life had just been sucked out of me. I was, when I was dating this guy, um, I mean, we would ride a motorcycle at 200 miles per hour. I was so reckless and I just didn't care. I didn't care about my life anymore. Um, and then, a month later, after I started dating this guy, he died in a motorcycle accident. Um, and 
a week after that, I found out that I was pregnant. Um, during this entire time, I was in school at UT for my doctorate in nutritional science. And so this all led to a point in my life where I can remember vividly today, I was sitting at the edge of my bed. I was a single mother, pregnant, um, in school. I had no income and I was, I was destroyed. Um, and I remember the moment where I, I was ready to take my own life. I was ready to, um, I had written a letter to my father about what to do with my son, Jackson. Um, and I was done. And I remember the moment of just um, I, crying and emptiness, just pure, that like, that's the word if I can give you a word, it was just emptiness. And, um, during that moment, it, and I don't, I don't know how to explain this in any other way, but in that moment in my life, something walked into a presence, walked into a room, sat down next to me, put his hand on my hand and said, you can do this. And it scared me more than anything. Cause I, I was never a believer in a higher power. I was never a believer, but there was a figure <laughs> in my room there. It was a presence that I could sense a presence in my room. And, uh, I didn't know what to do. Um, so I immediately got up. I, my son was banging on the door. So I let him in and we sat together and, and cried for a long time. Um, and I picked up my phone and I called one of my friends. I was, uh, we were friends in college years before. And I used to argue with her about her faith. And I called her and said, I don't know what is going on. I feel like something is in my house right now. And I really think I need to go to church. Um, and after that, she, she took me to church the following service and that led to my salvation. And from that moment, my life has changed. Um, I had the, the baby, um, her name is Kaylee, and I actually have an open adoption with a high school friend of mine within her and her husband were not able to have kids for years. Um, and they were seeking an adoption. So um, I, we have an open adoption and it's really amazing. Actually, we zoomed this past holiday, um, to do activities together and I'm remarried now with, um, four kids and I've finished my PhD and I have now dedicated my life to talking to people about this process, um, what it was for me, um, my testimony sharing, um, how God stepped in, in my life. Um, not to say that everyone is the same way, but it, that's what happened for me. And I want to be able to reach out to others and empower them, um, to know that you can have a life after loss. And, uh, I'm really appreciative of the time that I have to speak with you guys. And, um, I, I am so happy to see so many people eager to either hear or learn or grow in the field of suicide. And I just thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to say, you know, before we do anything else that I'm so sorry for your losses. And I really appreciate you being willing to share with us today about your story and how you overcame everything that you've gone through. So I really appreciate that. Um, so we just have uh, two more panelists that are gonna share their story um, before we move into questions. Um, next, we are gonna have Ray Jones. Uh, he has been a volunteer with TSPN for um, a few years and he's gonna share his story now. So um, Ray, if you'd be willing to share your story. Good morning, everyone. Um, my story is quite different um, from Emily's. I am a retired school teacher, basketball coach, uh, community activist. Uh, I went to college and came back to my hometown 
to pursue in, uh, a career in education. <clears throat> and I um, spent numerous years teaching and coaching and mentoring uh, young men and young women um, for 32 years. I um, had a daughter and a son and um, and uh, my son was always uh, active in sports, very intelligent young man, um, basketball, track, uh, even played football in his junior high school years, and he was good at all of them. <clears throat> uh, handsome young man, uh, had everything going for him that you could think anyone could have going for him. <clears throat> he was um, he was witty, he was uh, charming, and um, I would say he would be a delight for anyone who uh, came in contact with him. His conversation with people was, was, was it, it amazed me at how he could talk to anyone and everywhere he went, um, anybody he met, he could just carry on a conversation with them. And I would often wonder, you know, what are they talking about? Uh, how can he just talk to anyone and, and they just laugh and talk and carry on? And he was that type of guy. Um, he was, uh, <clears throat> I mean, um, this is the truth. You know, we were walking, um, he was in getting ready to enroll at um, uh, in college <clears throat> and um, we were walking and, and I would, we were going one direction and I would see all these young ladies coming back, meeting, we'd be meeting them and they would pass by and uh, they would take a look back at him or a look back at us or what have you. He never paid me any attention. He just continued to focus on what we were doing and what we were talking about. And I thought to myself, no way could I be 19 year old and all these pretty girls passing by and I could be focused enough to just continue on with what I'm doing and, and not pay attention to them. Um, he was a gentleman. He, he wasn't the type of guy that chased after women. Um, and I admired him for that. Uh, because to be 19 years old and um, and and not have that type of stuff on your mind amazed me, because it certainly was on my mind at 19 years old. And uh, <clears throat> but he he uh, I didn't get a chance to play college basketball, which is something that I always wanted to do. But I when I went to Tennessee State University, I ended up getting a job and um, and worked and and did not play basketball. So. He went to Haywood High School in Brownsville. And um, during his sophomore year, he was twice, excuse me, accused of something that he did not do. And on the second time, he, he came home that afternoon. And he says, Dad, says, uh, well, first, before that happened, uh, they called me and told me that, that he was going to have to go to Saturday school. I'm like, why does he have to go to Saturday school? They said, because he didn't go to the Thursday school that he had. I said, what was that all about? You know, so I, I was kind of hot headed. So I didn't go out to the school, I sent my wife. And um, so when we got home that afternoon, uh, and he told me the story on what had happened. Uh, there was a kid in at Haywood High School, they had cubicles where they didn't have walls, but they just had cubicles. and you know, you could go over the wall or what have you. So he made a paper airplane and, uh, and the teacher told him to, uh, to throw it away. He put it in the trash can and another kid went and got the paper airplane out of the trash can and flew it over the cubicle into another classroom. So it had his name on it because it was his paper. So when he brought it over and the teacher said, well, who threw his paper airplane? Well, nobody said anything. Of course he didn't either. Um, so after that, Principal called him to the office and, um, and told him that uh, he was gonna send him to Thursday school. So he didn't go to Thursday school. And uh, I guess I have to admit that he probably kind of got that for me. He wasn't willing to be punished for something that he didn't do. And ultimately, when I talked to the principal and he told me that, that uh, he had done this paper airplane deal and Bradley swore that he did not do it. And I'm sure I positively believe that he did not do it. He simply threw it in the trash can as the teacher told him to. 
the teach and the principal was like, okay, well, you're gonna do this Thursday school, this Saturday school. So Bradley said, Well, I am not gonna do a Saturday school for something I didn't do. He said, I don't want to go to this school no more. So that kind of started things, uh, not a spiral or anything, but but he transferred to Jackson Christian School at that point. We got to Jackson Christian School, everybody fell in love with him. The principals, the students, the other athletes. Uh, everybody just fell in love with him. He went in there his sophomore year, and um, he became uh, a sensation there. He was the highlight of the basketball team. Um, I mean, you know, he was a slam dunker, and, you know, he just had highlight films from basketball games there. So he had a great career at Jackson Christian School, and uh, so he went on to play college basketball, and he went to Heston College in Kansas, and he did his freshman year there. And after his freshman year, he decided he wanted to come back this way. So he came back and enrolled in the University of Memphis. And when he got to the University of Memphis, he started having knee trouble. And, uh, and so, you know, he did not play basketball at the University of Memphis, but he still was an athlete. And he was like an athletic trainer type of guy. So he worked out every day and, and you know, just continued to work out. But his knee injuries kept plaguing him. Um, and stopped him from going out for the track team and doing some other things that he wanted to do. Somewhere along the way, he became depressed. And uh, I cannot tell you exactly what his depression was. That is something to this day that I do not know the answer to. But as time went on, um, his depression became obvious. Uh, he had always been a nice, sweet, loving person. And he got to where he didn't hang around with the same friends that he had. He got to where he would kind of just hang to himself and, and would kind of be a loner type of person. And, um, and so we never really suspected uh, what was going on. Uh, he used to listen to uh, contemporary Christian music. And at the time, I couldn't understand it what you know what what was going on because you know the, he was 23 years old at the time now so the average person his age i'm sure that you know uh pop rock uh jazz or or some or rap or some type of music like that but that's that's not what he was listening to he was listening to contemporary music and then i asked him you know caleb was the station he liked to listen to so i would ask him you know why are you listening to caleb all the time he said, because it encourages me, you know, it motivates me. And um, contemporary Christian music. And being a black person listening to contemporary Christian music, I thought that was a little odd, but I still didn't, didn't, didn't see what was going on. So he had this depression that was driving him to, uh, to, to, to being a different person from the person that we knew. And, um, and so one morning, we um i like to rabbit hunt and that's my most the thing that i like to do more than anything rabbit hunting fish so the very first first day that uh during the rabbit season he's like dad let's take the dogs out well you know for him to tell me let's take the dogs out man that's that, i was as happy as i could be for him to want to go rabbit hunting with me so we go rabbit hunting and um and uh it took the dogs a while to try to get the rabbit. Finally got the rabbit up, so the rabbit started running, and uh, I turned my back. When I turned my back, I heard a shot. And when I looked around, I had lost my son. We were in the woods, and uh, it took a long time for the paramedics to get there, sheriff patrol and everybody, and uh, I was distraught, to say the least. I'm in the woods, me, my son, and dogs, and, um, and you know, it was all I could do to hold it together. I did the best that I could, and um, got through that day, and then life occurred. Reality set in, what had happened. It took a while for me to accept the fact that I had lost my son to a suicide. When the sheriff came, I was a personal friend of the sheriff at the time. And uh, they all knew 
what it occurred. And he says, Ray, says, um, I'm just gonna write this up as an accident right now. We will have to send him off for an autopsy and everything. So they did that. And when the report came back, they had to give me the report on what actually did happen. They did. But I still wasn't willing to admit to the general public what had happened. So I went on and left it at that, that it was an accident for a year or two. And I'm sure that some people uh, probably said uh, all sorts of things about what happened out there. Uh, probably everything from, from me shooting him to him shooting himself. Uh, I don't know what all people said, but I do know that people said all sorts of things. And for me to be uh, a person in a small town that everybody knows, a school teacher, a basketball coach, uh, it was difficult for me to process what all was going on with the general public as far as what their thoughts were. So after about a year or two, I decided that it's time for me to reveal what actually happened out there. So at that point, I decided to, to go public and let it be known that it was a suicide. And that was probably one of the hardest things I ever did was to admit that it was a suicide because just letting it go as an accident kind of kind of helped me as far as, as my walk in the community, if that makes any sense. Uh, blacks and suicide didn't go together too well uh, 10 years ago. And um, of course, it's a lot more now. But at that time, I felt that, um, that it was taboo. And for me to admit that took a lot. But since then, I have um, established a foundation called the Bradley Jones Foundation. And uh, you can go to our website, BradleyJonesFoundation.org and uh, sort of see who we are and what we are and what we're all about. And, and now uh, I, like Emily, spend a lot of my time trying to encourage other people uh, about the dangers of suicide and, uh, and warning signs and um, just exposure and not try to, try to hide the fact that uh, I was a part of it and, and, uh, and, and just try to get the message out there that is real. And uh, I will continue the story um, as this conference goes on. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I wanna say to you as well that I'm so sorry for your loss. And I, again, really appreciate you being willing to, to come today and speak about your story and tell us, tell us the story of your son. Um, we have one more panelist that's going to share their story before um, we go on to questions. Um, we have Lynn Julian today. She has also been volunteering with TSPN for several years. She's one of our advisory council members for the Southwest region. Um, so if you'd uh, be willing to come on and share, share your story now. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm so glad you joined us today. Um, my name is Lynn Julian, and I have been a mental health professional doing either counseling or social work uh, for almost 30 years, all of, all of my, or most of my adult life. Um, I had one child, my son, my bright shining star. Um, he inherited from me, unfortunately, uh, the brain disease of generalized anxiety disorder and struggled with that through most of his life, starting at about age 10. Uh, then he really got into riding BMX bicycles and, and uh, had a couple of traumatic brain injuries that more than likely did affect his ability to handle his emotions effectively. And when he was 14, he was injured in a football game and was prescribed opioid medications to help with the pain. And that started a lifelong battle for him with um, substance abuse. So, you know, he, he had some strikes against him and he, you know, had legal charges, spent time in and out of jail 
and was living in California and um, met a wonderful girl. And they just clicked immediately. And um, she was precious. She was sweet. Unfortunately, uh, she too had anxiety issues and uh, they began using drugs together and the relationship became very, very toxic, very toxic. Um, they were together probably about 12 years. I have two beautiful grandchildren from their marriage. And uh, eventually in the spring of 2018, it got to the point where it was undeniable anymore. They weren't able to take care of their children. Um, I ended up getting custody, temporary custody of the kids. Both of them were in and out of treatment that spring. Uh, I took the kids on Memorial Day weekend of 2018. I took the boys to their California grandmother and they were gonna spend the summer with, in California with the family out there. And mom and dad were gonna go to treatment and get better so they could get the kids back. And um, on June the 2nd, of 2018, uh, I got a call from my son. He was very paranoid. He was accusing me of talking to the California grandmother and telling her all kinds of un things that were not true about how bad they were doing and how they didn't need to get the kids back. And I could hear my daughter-in-law in the background egging all this on. And um, I lost my temper, I have a temper. <laughs> And I lost my temper and I was sick, quite frankly, sick and tired of dealing with it. And now that the kids were not there in California, I was about to go let it, just let it fly. And I did, and it got very ugly. Um, my son and I got into a physical confrontation. Uh, I got punched in the head, I got choked and um, words were spoken that I wish I had never said. And at one point, as the com confrontation's winding down, my son is staring off into space and he says, you know, you're gonna die alone. And I said, well, you know what? I'd really rather die alone than have to deal with all this BS that you've been giving me all these years. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. And I left and I got a call about an hour and a half later and he said, mama, Cremate me. I had heard, and let me back up just a little bit. My son had said to me multiple times since he was 19 years old, I, I'm just going to kill myself. I don't want to live anymore. I'm just going to kill myself. I had heard that so many times at this point and dealt with so much from him and his wife. I didn't listen. I didn't listen. And so I said, okay, son, I will. And he said, goodbye, mama. I said, goodbye. Went to sleep, sat straight up in the bed at 3.30 a.m. on June the 3rd, 2018 and said, I don't have a son anymore. At 8.30 that morning, I woke up again. I sent him a text and said, son, you know, I love you. We can work through this too. It'll all be all right. At 8.48 a.m., I got a call from my daughter-in-law. I could not understand a word she was saying. The only thing I understood was, he's dead, he's dead, he's gone. I jumped in my car. I drove down to the house where they were living that I had rented for them and was paying for and walked in the door. And my universe imploded because there was my son and he was gone. I touched him and he was cold. And everything changed in that moment. Everything changed. My life will never be the same. My daughter-in-law did not handle it well. Her family came from California. They tried to help her. We got her back into a 
a hospital and she was supposed to go to rehab after that. She never went to rehab. On June the 28th of 2018, I went to the house where my daughter-in-law and son had lived. I walked in the front door and there was my daughter-in-law. She was still alive, but barely. We began CPR. Um, EMS was called. Uh, the next morning, I was at the hospital praying for her and felt a presence come and stand beside me, much like Emily. And I'm not sure who it was. Uh, I, I am a friend of Jesus. Uh, so I'm current, firmly convinced it was Jesus. It was my son. It was the Holy Spirit. But someone came and stood beside me and I thought, oh, thank you, God. You're going to come. You're going to heal her. No, they were coming to take her home. She was um, pronounced brain dead later that day. So on June the 29th, I lost my daughter-in-law to suicide and substance abuse as well. 26 days apart. If I did the math right, I'm not very good at math. On May the 18th of 2019, I get a call from my son's biological father. His oldest son, who had also struggled with anxiety, post-traumatic stress, other things, had also died by suicide that morning. So within a year, I lost three people who were very, very dear to me. And I'm a mental health professional. I could not save my own son or my daughter-in-law. It became one more thing I need to tell you about my son or a couple of things. He was a precious soul. He loved other people. He never met a stranger, much like Ray's son. He could talk to anybody about anything, anytime, made friends wherever he went. If he had a shirt, one shirt on his back and you needed it, he'd give it to you. He was just like that. He was a precious soul who got lost. He got lost with brain diseases of anxiety and substance abuse. Right before he went to rehab in the spring of 2018, he said, Mama, I had the best conversation with Jesus I've ever had before. And Jesus told me that if I'll take advantage of this opportunity that he's giving me, that I will, he will be able to work through me to change thousands of lives. I said, well, then son, you better take the opportunity. Well, my son did not stay. My son chose to leave to end his pain. And I believe in that moment, in that moment when he made that decision to leave us, I, I truly believe, I've, I've thought about this and prayed about this, I truly believe my son was in so much pain and felt so hopeless and felt like such a burden to everyone, to his children, to me, to his grandmother, his wife, everyone. I think he honestly thought he was doing what would be best for everybody else. I, maybe that's not the case. You know what? It, it helps me believe it. By golly, I'm gonna believe it. But because he had that conversation with God and I'm still here, it quickly became my mission to be there for others and to share his story and to let people know my son's life matters. My son was a beautiful soul and there is hope. As long as there is life, there is hope. And that is why I do what I do. That is why I share his story and Again, I'm so glad all of you are here today. Uh, thank you for letting me share. And hopefully as we continue to walk through this, we'll be able to answer some questions you have and bring some hope.
Thank you so much for sharing your story. And again, I'm so sorry for your losses. And I so appreciate you being willing to share the story of your son and daughter-in-law and, you know, help others by, by sharing his story. I really appreciate you coming today. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your stories today. Uh, I know it's really hard to, to talk about sometimes. I really appreciate you guys. Um, so we'll move into some questions um, for you guys. And pretty much, I know it can be hard over Zoom, but it, as I read the questions, anybody that has thoughts on it can jump, any of the panelists that have thoughts can jump in. Um, but how do you guys think that grief from a loss by suicide is different than other forms of grief, either that you've experienced or that you've seen other people experience? Looks like Ray is going to say something. I'm sorry, Emily, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're, you're not, I was waiting for you. Would you like to go? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't know that, that this, this holds true for everyone because I'm sure that it's different for, for everyone that deals with, with grief. People, people deal with grief in different ways. Um, but I think that, and, and I'm not speaking from a personal standpoint, I'm speaking from what I think is general. In my opinion, uh, I think that, that most people feel like it was something they could have done. Um, and with everyone, it's probably something different. I'm sure um, with Emily, Lynn, and with myself, looking back, you know, we all probably think that there's something that I could have done, you know. Now, what that something is, who knows? But I think as far as what the difference between the grief from, from an accident or from uh, illness as opposed to suicide, you just feel like, you just feel like, if I had one more chance, that 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 comment that they made a week ago, or or that reaction that I got to to something, uh, there 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 might have been one trigger that I didn't that I didn't look at, that I probably could have saw something coming, um, but 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 you have to understand that that it probably wasn't. But deep down inside, you just feel like there may have been one something that I could have caught that might could have stopped this, maybe. So there's a little bit of, of guilt that, that will come down upon you, um, even though, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too long, but even though, even though you didn't do it, you didn't, you didn't cause it, and I think that's the most important thing that, that people have to understand when it comes to grief and suicide. You didn't cause it, you didn't do it. The person, the person chose this themselves. And it's so hard for us to accept the fact that my loved one made this choice. And, um, I Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Lynn. Go ahead, yeah. Lynn. I was I was just gonna piggyback off of Ray that last statement that he said, and I think for me the biggest difference between all the deaths that I experienced, even though some of them were sudden and some of them were more prolonged, um, the one thing that I will say that's different about Kevin's suicide was it was his decision. Um, Whereas with my mother, it was a disease. With my grandmother, it was disease. And with the, the man that I was dating, um, that was an accident. Um, but the suicide was a very distinct decision, um, whether in, in the correct mental state or not, it was, it was his decision. And that's what was difficult for me to understand and, and have to be okay with not understanding. Mm -hmm. It, exactly, Emily. It's first there's the guilt of why did I not reach out that night? Why did I not see this? Why this? The whys. 
the in, in a loss by suicide, the unanswered questions and the inability to have closure, true closure ever, is it makes it very much different. Um, also, just from a, a brain function standpoint, you know, when you experience any kind of traumatic loss like that, uh, the brain reacts very differently than if the brains had time to prepare for the grief. And it takes a lot longer for the brain to heal from a traumatic grief like suicide uh, than it does a normal grief. Um, for instance, my, my mother who was 93 just passed away in February and this is completely different. It's completely different. Um, I think I think that's for me the biggest difference is the whys, the and then the I'm not good enough. You left me. You know how could you how could you leave? How could you do this? There's a lot of anger too uh, for some people who lose people by suicide. It's like how dare you do this to everybody? You know, people still believe it's a very cowardly thing to do, a very selfish thing to do. And I mean, ultimately, yes, you can view it that way. You absolutely can. But like I said, knowing everything I know about my son, I believe in his mind and his altered thinking at that time, it was the least selfish thing he could possibly do anymore because he'd been so selfish for so long in his addiction. So it's very, grief from suicide is very complicated. Definitely. It sounds like, you know, there's a lot of different emotions that kind of come into play um, when it's grieving somebody who died by suicide that may not, may not be there um, in grief from other forms of death. Um, and as far as, you know, when you guys were, especially right after it happened, what are some ways that the people around you supported you that were helpful? And what are some of the things that people either said or did that weren't so helpful? Like what advice do you have for someone who knows somebody who's losing, who has just lost someone to suicide and how they can best support them? And what are some of the things that are I'll best start. not to say? Okay. If I may. Um, I am blessed by God to have a big, beautiful, loving tribe of people around me. And the thing that people did, two things that meant the most to me. Number one, they showed up. They showed up. They called, they texted, they messaged me on Facebook. They sent flowers to the memorial service. They took me out to eat. They helped point me in the right direction when I was literally wandering around in circles, unable to remember what I was supposed to do next for months and months. Um, they showed up. Th and those that did show up, 98% of them showed absolutely no judgment whatsoever about how I lost my son. They listened. They let me talk about my son because I talked about my son a lot. I I wore the way that he died, the way he left, I wore it like a suit of armor and I dared people to not acknowledge how my son had passed. I, I wasn't gonna go there, you know, it is what it is, let's deal with it. And they let me do that. And when I, you know, when I found people that weren't gonna let me do that, I didn't, I tried not to get mad, I just said, okay, we won't talk to them about this anymore. You know, people can't often, not everyone can handle and know what to say. Uh, one thing I would say is not very helpful or wasn't for me was when people who had not lost someone to suicide and even a few people that had said, I know exactly what you're feeling right now. No, you don't. We can't ever truly know what someone else is feeling because we all have our different experiences. What I found helpful was when people said, I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. I'm, I'm so sorry, help me understand and just listened. Okay, 
And um, I, I would 100% agree with Lynn and everything that she just said. Um, I know for me, um, a couple of things that, you know, my family did for me. And, and when I say family, I also mean my, my inner circle, my close friends. Um, one of my, one of my friends who I went, was in school with, she moved in with me. <laughs> um, she moved in and slept on my couch, <laughs> uh, with me for a while. And, um, I had countless people, uh, offer to take my son, um, for the day and just take him out and let him go play. And that was huge for me. Um, just to have that space. And, and I can't explain what it's like to have a child um, who all of the sudden their father isn't there anymore. Um, the, the cries for his daddy, I remember more than anything um, because it was excruciating and it was just like ripping that open over and over and over um, until finally I was able to explain to him that his daddy wasn't going to be coming back. Um, and at two, they don't get that. <laughs> so, um, for, for people to step in and take him just to, to let him also be a child and go play and let me catch up on things that I had to do. Mind you, I was pregnant too at the time, you know, and, so I had to get used to walking in the home. One of my dogs would like tear the trash all over the place. I'm pregnant with my son. I've just been at school all day and working, pick him up, like having to do all that on my own every single day was really hard. So having those people just to be there for that, my, my aunt came in um, and cleaned my house one day. And that was just like, I mean, she was a saint that cleaned my house and brought me flowers like, that. you know, just a gesture like that, bringing food, you know, for, for me in that moment, I needed that. Um, and also like just for people to, to sit with me, um, there didn't have to be words spoken. If you just could sit with me and let me experience, like go through my emotions, whether it was anger or, um, me sobbing or singing a song that brought back memories and breaking me down, whatever it was just sitting there with me, being present with me. So I didn't feel alone. Um, that was, that was really huge for me. Um, and I would say along with Lynn that, you know, I think the, the most difficult thing for me was judgment um, people ja passing judgment about, about me, about Kevin. And, you know, it, it that made it very difficult because I, 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 now looking back on it, I'll tell you, I don't think I handled it the way that I should, but in that moment, who knows how you're going to respond. You can't train for that. And, and I'm a veteran. I was in the military. I've been trained on how to handle quite difficult circumstances. And my response was to drink, which right now I probably wouldn't be. Um, but I didn't know that back then. And I didn't know how I would cope with it. I didn't know. I, there's no way to really prepare for that, um, that loss and how you're going to respond to it. So, um, for the people closest to me to just allow me to grieve in the way that I was without judging me and making it more difficult and, you know, stepping in where I needed it. My, my father was a voice of reason to me multiple times. And I appreciated that there were times when I didn't listen and he didn't harp on me for it, but it did. When I, when that decision came along again, I remembered his voice and it helped me get through that process, you know, so um, finding a way to, to, you know, if I, if the person reaches out to you and, you know, and they're in that place of hurt, listening to them, offering from your own heart, what you think, um, could be helpful to them without judgment. Um, I would say it would probably be the biggest thing that people can do to help someone that has 
um, just experienced a loss or is going through really any stage in this process, listening um, and not being, not having judgment and not applying your own attitudes towards suicide, I think is, is really key. I have to agree 100% with what Emily just said about the judgment. The one thing that uh, Bradley uh, left with me more than anything else was to not to pass judgment on people, no matter what. Uh, there was one time, this is off the ball just a little bit, and I'm going to be brief. Uh, I was having basketball tryouts for uh, middle school girls. And there was this really, really heavy set girl trying out for the basketball team. And me being a, a 40 something year old at the time man and my little 14, 15 year old son. No, he was older than that. He was probably about 16, 17 at the time when the trials were going on. And I'm just laughing and joking with him like, why is that girl want to trial for basketball? And he goes like, dad says, uh, don't judge her. She could end up being your best player. And I just laughed and laughed and laughed. That girl ended up being a starter on my basketball team. So he left an impression on me about judgment. And I spent a lot of my time telling people to not to judge. So, in, so piggybacking off of Emily, uh, from the bad, what I'm coming from right now is, I think the probably one of the worst things that, that you know that people are judging you. And you have this little something around you when you go places, when it first occurs, that you know that everybody knows that you just lost someone to suicide. And there's this stigma that, that you look around and, and even if you don't think that they're even if you don't know these people, you just know that they know you and they know that you lost someone because I'm in a small town and everyone knows what goes on in small towns. So people around me, you know, you just look and, and you just get a feel that everyone knows that you just lost somebody to suicide and, and what are they thinking about you? And that's, that's from the negative standpoint. From the positive standpoint, um, for me, uh, I became friends with some other people who lost uh, sons and we became a sort of a little uh, fathers who lost sons. I didn't know anyone that lost a son to suicide, but I knew some guys that had lost their sons. So we became close and we held each other up, even though we lost sons in different ways. But one of my friends lost his son um, to a murder. One of my friends lost his son to an illness and, uh, and I lost mine to a suicide. So even though we all three lost our son different ways, we still lost our son. And, uh, and one of the things that Lynn has stated earlier is that if somebody tells you that you know, I know how you feel, no, you don't. And she's 100% right about that. You don't know how someone feels that loses a child. If you hadn't lost a child, you'll never know what that feels like. Because as Lynn said, life changes forever. And it doesn't get back to normal after that. You just, you just go on and be as normal as you can you know, you got to get your joy somewhere down the line. But at the same time, people telling you, I know how you feel. They really don't know how you feel. But those friends that I had that had lost sons also knew how I felt. And that is what helped me probably a lot was to, to become close with other people that had not gone through exactly what I had gone through, but the end result, which was the loss of a son, was the same. Thank you guys for sharing. It sounds like, you know, being, you know, for people that know somebody who've lost someone to suicide, just being there for them and not judging them, not pretending to know what they're feeling if you don't, um, but just being there for them and listening um, is huge, it sounds like, from what you guys are saying. So thank you. Um, our next question is, what is kind of piggybacking off of that? What advice would you have for someone who has lost someone to suicide themselves, whether it be recently or years past, you know, were there resources that were helpful to you? Were there, you know, support groups that you joined? What, what um, advice would you have for people going through that grieving process now? Uh, if I can start, um, I have some fairly concrete things that really did help me. Uh, and first of all, I will say, and this is just for me, this is for me, my faith in Jesus and my friendship with him, if it wasn't for that, I'd probably be drooling in a corner somewhere. Um, so that first and foremost, but the concrete things. Um, 
And if you don't have a spiritual side, please don't discount what I'm about to say as far as the concrete coping skills. Um, number one, breathe. Remember to breathe. Uh, I found myself hyperventilating all the time. Number two, eat. Remember to eat. Uh, I'd go two and three days and go, when is the last time I had a meal? Um, you have to take care of your body in addition to your brain. Um, number three, sleep is vital and can be extremely elusive in the early months after. Um, I, did, I used melatonin a lot. I used a lot of natural things, but eventually after about six months, I had to get some sleep aid medication from the doctor so I could get back on a sleep schedule. Um, it's very important. Um, do not isolate yourself from others because there is that tendency to want to sit in a dark room or just be in your house and lock the door and not interact with others. Please don't do that. Please allow others to be around. Um, exercise sounds very counterintuitive. It's like I do not feel like getting up out of the bed for days at a time. But Again, exercise is very healing for your body and it helps your brain to start to heal from the grief brain because people grief brain is real. It is very real. Your, your brain is struggling to get back to some kind of normal functioning during this whole process. Um, so exercise is important. Journaling, uh, getting that pain out on paper helped me more than I can possibly tell you. I still do it. It's a habit I picked up then and I still do it. Um, those, I think, and, and no, it's gonna feel like you're losing your mind. It is really gonna feel like you're going crazy. You're not, it's grief brain. Give yourself time, be kind to yourself. And remember, it's gonna be a long time and it's gonna suck for a long time. And there's nothing I can do but wade through that suck. Trying to avoid the pain is gonna prolong it. I mean, you never get over it. I'll, I'll always hurt a little bit, but it becomes easier to carry as you cope with it and walk through it instead of trying to walk around it. For me, um, and I agree with everything that Lynn just said, and I think you can kind of sum up what Lynn just said by saying you've got to take care of yourself. Um, nobody else is going to take care of you. All those other people around you, yes, they are friends and that does help. But, but ultimately, you have got to take care of yourself. You have got to come to grips with the fact that um, that, that loved one is gone. And you are not going to do anything to bring that loved one back. So I think the thing that, that helps me the most and that did help me the most, two things. Uh, one, to get back to doing those things that I uh, love doing. Um, I, um, I love the rabbit hunting and, um, and, and for the rest of that season, I, I couldn't go. I couldn't, I couldn't stand the shot, the sound of a shotgun. Uh, and as time went on, I was like, now wait now, this is what I love to do the most. I love to hear those rabbit dogs run a rabbit. You know, I really don't care if I shoot a rabbit or not, but I just love to hear dogs run and bark and I just love that. And, uh, and I was able to get that joy back. And, and, and once I was able to get uh, that joy back uh, to, to, to do the things that I really enjoy doing, which I'm an outdoorsman, uh, so, uh, I, I slowly got back into, into doing things that, that I really enjoyed doing. And then um, spending time helping other people. Um, as, as Lynn said, you can't just sit around in a closet. You've got you to come out of that closet and you've got to get going. And you'll be surprised a lot of times people will come to you to try to comfort you and you'll end up comforting them just about how you handle the things and how you, how you carry the burden that you're carrying. And they're wondering, you know, how can he be this happy after what he's gone through? You know, but you're not happy about what happened, but you're trying to get your joy back. And if you don't get your joy back, you are going to become physically, mentally, and emotionally 
sick and disabled and you won't be able to help anyone. So trying to get out of that rut, it's gonna take some time, but you must, you must take care of yourself and your own spirit and your own soul or you will deteriorate fast. And I 100% agree. Um, for me, it was that routine that Lynn was talking about. You know, I had to develop a routine. Um, and, and I was forced to, I didn't really have much of an option um, because I had, you know, I had my son that was too, like he was entirely dependent on me. Um, so I, you know, I was forced to, to get into a routine. Um, but it did end up helping, helping me and, you know, adding in the exercise, the sleep was huge. I didn't sleep for three days afterwards. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't function, uh, unless I passed out. <laughs> that was the only way I could get sleep. Um, so the, the sleep I would say is really big. That does help you, you know, it helps your mind. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, a big part of, grief for me was giving myself permission, um, giving myself permission to, to feel the emotions, um, regardless of what they were, whether it was, uh, hurt or anger or pain and just, you know, recognizing in myself, like, um, this is, this is what I feel right now. Don't push it down. Don't, you know, hide it away in a closet face it, uh, talk to somebody about it. I, I saw a counselor afterwards, you know, and I had to work through those, those emotions and those feelings. And, um, you know, there are resources out there to help people process, um, because it has to happen. And, and I think that's what, um, what we're all hitting on is, is getting through, getting through the process, processing those emotions, getting your mind and your body and your spirit back to a place where you can function again. For me, my faith was huge. Um, at that point, uh, you know, this, this, this was me coming to know the Lord. I didn't know, well, refused to know beforehand. Um, so this was me coming to know the Lord. And um, for me, that was huge. I, you know, abstained from drinking, which made obviously an enormous impact on my life um, and still does. But being able to find, use that as my source of hope and, um, and reaching out as well as what was mentioned before, like being able, reaching out and helping other people, you know, that's serving other people and helping other people get through um, the, the pain that I experienced is, I would say other than my, my spiritual walk, I'd say is number two in helping me, uh, it was number two in helping me overcome the pain and, over, and grieving. Well, thank you guys so much for all of your input today. Um, I cannot thank our panelists enough for sharing their stories, um, for sharing their their tragedies, but also the, the hope that can come from it. And honestly, it, it reminds me of just the power of our testimony and how even in just sharing, I've been watching the chat and seeing how your stories are impacting the people that are on the call today, um, seeing how it enables other people to feel empowered to speak up is incredibly important. And so I'm just very thankful for your willingness to share and also to teach, because that was one of the things that I really wanted you guys to do is just to teach us, you know, from your, your point of view, what is helpful, what is not helpful, um, what, you know, what can we do to support those that may be grieving? So uh, thank you very, very much for sharing that information today. Um, we're going to move into sharing a little bit about some resources that are available. And um, I, I want to encourage you guys, as I'm talking about resources, 
if there's anything that um, you would want to talk more one on one with someone about if you um, are struggling at any point during the conversation today again I just want to encourage you guys to reach out you can reach out to me um, I know the panelists have said that they're more than willing to help you guys as well and listen. Um, so I'm just thankful for your willingness to reach out if you need support. So um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and share some resources for those that may be contemplating suicide. We've talked about losing someone to suicide, we want to also kind of empower you guys to prevent further suicides that could occur. And so I'm just going to share very briefly some resources that you guys can utilize. Um, let me get this pulled up for you guys. And one thing that I want to make sure you guys understand before I talk about these resources really fast is in no way, shape, form, or fashion would we ever say that if you've lost someone to suicide, that it is your fault. Um, we are not here to invoke guilt or shame people or condemn people for their loss. In fact, one of the things that we believe as TSP and staff members is that you, you can't be responsible for the things that you didn't know, that you weren't aware of. And as you've already heard from the stories that have been told this morning, even as a mental health professional, even as someone that has been trained and might be aware of what to look for, we, we miss things. You know, we are humans. And so we're not here to say that you should have done better, you should have done more. Um, but rather just give you some resources and some options. If you know someone who may be currently struggling, um, here's some things that you can look for. So the first one is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you know of anybody that may not be in immediate danger, but they have maybe thoughts of suicide, they need to talk to someone that could be an objective party, we would encourage you guys to call that 1-800 number, which is 1-800-273-8255. Again, that's 1-800-273-8255. Also, um, a popular resource that we get with young people, if you know someone who is a young person that may be considering suicide or is in some other form of crisis, you can text the crisis text line, which we encourage you guys to text the letters TN to 741741. So again, that is TN, texting the letters TN to 741741. And there is a trained crisis responder on the other end of that line that is able to respond to that text and go back and forth with that individual. Um, as far as survivor groups, you're going to hear about that more in just a minute um, from Carol Chastain Beal. We're really excited to hear about those survivor groups coming up in just a minute, but you can visit our website also to learn a little bit more about survivor support groups. And after I finish sharing my slides, I'm also gonna drop a flyer in the chat box for you guys that will have some other survivor resources on it as well. Um, if you know somebody that is struggling and you know that they have a strong and immediate desire to die, if you are concerned that they are very serious about their um, ideations or their thoughts, then you might want to contact mobile crisis in your area. And that basically is just a way to help and get someone more immediate help. They, in the middle of COVID, have developed a lot of procedures to do telehealth conferences where they can do screenings over mobile devices. But if you're really concerned that someone may not seek support, they're not going to follow through with the things that you have put in place for them, you don't have the ability to contact them later, you will probably need to contact Mobile Crisis in that instance. Um, another resource that you can consider if you are unable to get a hold of Mobile Crisis in your area is just a walk-in center, a crisis stabilization unit, or the emergency room is also able to do evaluations for individuals that may be struggling with suicidal behavior. If you're in the Southwest region, these are the three mobile crisis providers that are in our area, but we know that this is not covering the entire state of Tennessee. 
if you go into TSPN's website, we do have resource directories that will point you to the mobile crisis providers in your area. You can also go on to Google and just type mobile crisis near me. Um, you should be able to find that out. But these are the Southwest counties and the um, mobile crisis providers for those counties. And then a question we get pretty often is, when do I need to get law enforcement involved? If I'm concerned that someone may be acting on their thoughts, is it appropriate to call law enforcement? And we would encourage people to call law enforcement if someone's in an altered state of mind, maybe they are under the influence of some kind of drug or alcohol, if they have initiated harm and they need immediate medical attention, or if they have a, a gun or a dangerous weapon, we don't ever encourage people to try to be superheroes and to take charge of that because you never know when someone would potentially act out in um, their emotions. We hear sometimes of murder suicides and we would never want to put people in situations where they would personally be in danger. So be sure to reach out to law enforcement if you know that they are in a dangerous situation where they could harm someone else along with themselves. Um, and so those are just some of the resources that I wanted to share with you guys real quick. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point and also remind you guys that I'm gonna drop a document into the chat box here in just a minute that will have additional survivor resources for those of you who wanna know more about survivor support groups, just the different resources that are available across um, the United States. And um, so at this point, we're gonna hand it back over to Michaela and Michaela is going to introduce our next speaker and talk to us a little bit more about support groups in um, the state of Tennessee. All right, so uh, next we're going to hear from Carol Chastain Beal. So she has done a lot of work um, in the state of Tennessee with survivor groups. Uh, she's also been part of the Memorial Wall and the Memorial Quilt, which we're gonna talk about. Um, so uh, if you could just, uh, Ms. Carol, if you could just kind of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and what got you started working with TSPN and with survivor groups. Uh, you're muted. Okay. First of all, though, I do want to also add my words of appreciation to Lynn and Ray and Emily for what they shared. Um, every single story is different, yet they all have something in common. And of course, as I listened, I listened thinking of my own story, Orland's story, my daughter, and elements from each of their stories fit, each of their journeys and the way they cope. They're all different but we all still have the fact that their deaths were self-inflicted in common. And I appreciate what all they've said. Um, I'm a retired fifth grade teacher, taught for a hundred years in South Georgia. And at about six years before I retired, my daughter Orlin, who was 18 at the time, took her life. Um, I'm not going to go into Arlen's story now because that's not why I'm here, other than her story fits a lot of what they said. Um, drugs were an issue. Arlen was diagnosed with bipolar disorder after she died, and our ignorance of suicide was a factor. But anyway, when Arlen died, I knew immediately that I needed a support group. Um, I had already been trained in support group facilitation. I was leading support groups at that time for victims of domestic violence. And I had learned the value of a support group to empower people to learn that they can take control of their lives. Um, the connection with other people that walk the same road so you know you aren't alone can be life-saving. And so I basically 
sort of started a support group at that time. But it took a couple years before I could get one online. So I started the email support group, Parents of Suicide, in 1998. Um, Parents of Suicide is still going today. Um, it was the first such email support group in the world, as far as I know. The difference in an email support group and a face-to-face -face group, I want to kind of point out, well, I'll get to that later. You asked about what brought me to this. So what brought me to this, to the things I do is I needed to do things to survive. Um, when Arlen died, I felt like she killed me too. I wanted to die every single day. I never felt suicidal but I knew that I had to do something. Um, when I moved to Tennessee in 2005, I immediately started the support group in Columbia um, for grieving loss by suicide. As soon as I started it, TSPN found me because I put something in the newspaper and recruited me to join the advisory council um, I really didn't want to. I told them I didn't like meetings and I don't, <laughs> but they said, we have all these professionals. We have no one speaking for the families of those that have lost someone to suicide. And I said, well, I guess I have to do it then. So I served on the advisory council for a hundred years. I'm an emeritus member now. Um, I also then started Learn to Do QPR training, which is a basic suicide prevention program, probably one of the first ones that started nationwide, and I did it, um, many suicide prevention trainings. Through the email group, I started make, getting suicide memorial quilts made, actually. I had gone to a conference in Washington, D.C. on suicide prevention, and somebody had a quilt there, and it was called Faces of Suicide. And we could see the power of people seeing their pictures, because without the pictures, um, we just hear statistics, we hear numbers. Oh. A thousand people killed, took their lives in Tennessee, for example. Well, that's a number. But when people see the quilts, they see that these are real people. These are people that are loved. These are people just like all of us. People that see the quilts often, well, then it will open the door for them to talk about their own losses. So through the appearance of suicides, we started making our own quilts. Then once I got involved with TSPN, um, one year right after I got here, a lady did a quilt for TSPN. And the next year they asked me to do it. And I've been doing it ever since. This is a lesson to anybody. Once you volunteer one time, from then on you're stuck. I think I've done 18 quilts since then. But it's a very meaningful way for me to help other people, but it is very meaningful for the people that have their loved ones on the quilt. I know earlier Ray mentioned that his son Bradley is on one of the quilts, or maybe others here who have loved ones that were on one of the quilts. Um, and, and that's meaningful. In Tennessee, TSPN takes those quilts, right? At many of our conferences, they display them. That's beautiful there. Um, they take them all over the state for educational and awareness events to help other people understand what suicide is. And thank you for sharing that. Um, also through the Parents of Suicides email group, at some point, we started saying we need a memorial wall to remember those that have died by suicide because 
there was a lot of attention to the Vietnam Memorial Wall. And with the stigma that goes to suicide, it was almost like, we aren't ashamed of them. We need a, perm a place where people can see their faces, where we can remember them. And so after I'd moved to Columbia, just sort of came up with the idea one day, let's create a memorial wall. So um, we had built a picnic pavilion in our backyard in Columbia for retreats. So we built a wall back there, my husband and son did. And people started sending in pictures and we got a man to make the memorial tiles to put on the wall. Um, we had about 600 memorial tiles on the wall when circumstances came that we had to move to Spring Hill. And I didn't know what to do with the wall. And I said, we, you know, we've got to find some place to adopt it. People had come from all over the world to see the wall. There were memorial tiles on the wall from all over the world. And TSPN, um, the director at the time was Scott Ridgeway, and he said, Carol, this wall is too valuable. We can't let it leave Tennessee. So the decision was made for TSPN to basically, I call it adopt the wall to take custody of it. And so now TSPN provides the home for the wall and it was moved over. Um, anybody in the world can get a picture on it. Um, we have it set that anybody that wants a name on the wall, I mean a picture, contact me and I give them directions. And um, people that have come from all over the world after the wall was moved to TSPN office, we had a memorial program, the first one, to read the names because we read the names on the wall every single year out loud so their names are not forgotten. So we had a memorial program after the wall was moved and people even came from all over the world for the memorial program. Um, we had, I think, 150 people, people from Canada, I know from Ireland, one from New Zealand, some from England, because it is so meaningful that they want to know their loved ones are on the wall. So um, there may be some here that have pictures on the wall, I don't know. But anyway, and since TSPN has just moved to another office. We're getting ready to move the wall to the new office. And we're working on plans for that right now. And um, last year, we could not have the reading of the names out loud. I mean, in person, because of the pandemic. We had it presumed basically just like this, with all the tiles showing. And so we did it that way. Um, I'm not sure that we'll be able to do it in person this year or not. If not, we'll do it virtually and then next year in person, we'll work that out. But anyway, um, the wall and the quilt are things that people can um, do if, and they're not for everyone, but if it is meaningful to somebody to know that the picture of their loved one is helping other people understand the reality of suicide. That, that there were people that were loved, they're not junk people, they're not throwaway people. Then the wall has made a difference. If people appreciate the value of the wall and the quilt, my way of looking at it is they will be a lot more likely to vote for legislation that supports suicide prevention to support suicide prevention programs. And that's also very, very important. So Michaela, I think I kind of rambled around. I don't know that I answered everything you asked, but anyway, I said something. 
So what did I not say that you wanted me to say? <laughs> I think you pretty much covered everything for that question. <laughs> yeah, once you start talking, it's hard to stop, yeah. <laughs> um, so as far as the support groups that you, I know you mentioned oh. some online support groups. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that has been, especially yeah. in the past year or so with COVID? And yeah, me, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't say a lot about the support groups. The in-person support groups are wonderful. Um, you get the chance to meet in person with people, to form a, a personal connection, to hug, to talk, to cheer. Some people will not go to an in-person support group in their community, I've learned. And, and I understand the reason. Several people have told me, I'm not going because, number one, I don't want to be talking about the negative things about my loved ones, people that live in my community, even though we swear, com I mean, it's confidential, you just never know. And I just don't want to share around people that know us. And, and that makes sense. There are things that we don't want to be sharing. Um, like I said, but it does have definitely advantage. The email advantage to me, the first, when it first started was, number one, just like this almost, you can be in your pajamas in 24 hours a day and communicate from email. If you're upset in the middle of the night, you can get up, you can read the messages from others. And, and their stories are just like ones Ray and Lynn and Emily told in a way, and feel that connection, whether you write back or not, you can feel and know that you're not alone. If you want to share, they will listen without passing judgment. The email group offered the, because the internet was developing as the email group was developing, we came up early on with the idea of having a retreat every year so they could meet. Now this is before Google and before pictures were put on the internet really. So I made the mistake one time of just saying, anybody want to come one weekend and let's just meet each other. And 18 people showed up. Um, they told me they were coming and I said, well, I don't know, I, I can't cook for that many people. But a former student of mine had contacted me about that time, Angela, her name was Perfect Angel. She said, I love to cook. She came over and cooked all her meals. I said, well, our town didn't even have a hotel. It was Pavo, Georgia, population 700. So we took our upstairs, which was one big room, and rented fold-up cots. And we had 16, well, there were 18 counting on me, 16 people, men and women both, sleeping upstairs. We put a sheet up to separate them. And then at the end of that first retreat, we called it a retreat. Everybody just said, I'll see you next year. So it continued and it evolved over the year. But through the email groups, we published cookbooks where the recipes had names like Susie Q's favorite liver casserole or whatever. And they wrote their memories of the person with the recipe memorial books, and the quilts. Now, Facebook has taken a little bit away from the email groups because the email group had gotten to about 800 people, parents of suicide. But once Facebook came, people would join POS, they would get to know a few people, then they'd get them on their Facebook. So they didn't really need POS connection, they had their own support group on their Facebook in a sense. But it's still about 250 people. Um, we've added the Zoom support group to the, the email group. And just like the three people that shared their stories today, every Sunday our POS members get together and share their stories and talk about the issues that concern them. We have a partner email group friends and families of suicides. It's for anybody other than a bereaved parent. 
So we've got a variety of connection. They also have once a month meetings for on Zoom now, in addition to the email support group. Although theirs are more get acquainted because they just love each other so much <laughs> that they just want to connect and be friends. But, you know, in-person groups are different. The pandemic basically eliminated in-person groups for a while. Some groups have started back, I think, with social distancing, some haven't. For the groups I lead, the Columbia group I closed up after I moved to Spring Hill and started groups in Spring Hill. But it was a small group that had not had time to fully develop. And so they weren't particularly interested in the Zoom support group meeting. But now one of our other members is starting it up in person again. So we're going to be meeting twice a month with social distancing and see how it goes. So there are options. And people just have to do what works for them, you know. Right. Um, yeah, so it sounds like, I mean, so the email groups have been, you know, present for a long time and then just kind of transitioning to Zoom as, you know, COVID has, has uh, played a role. Um, what advice would you have for some, you know, if somebody is thinking about, you know, maybe I want to start a support group of my own or I want to get one going, what advice would you have for someone? First of all, before you start a support group, make sure you've dealt with your own major grief issues first, the trauma part especially. Um, I know the first group I started was called Compassionate Friends. It wasn't suicide. It was parents whose children died of any cause of death. And their rule was it has to be at least two years, you have to be at least two years removed from the death of your child before we let you start a group. I mean, I'm sure some people may be ready before then, some later, but I guess two years is sort of an arbitrary measurement. But make sure you've met your own most of the needs first. You can't start one just because you need the help. That's what I tried to do. And I sort of did, but I won't go into that. I got somebody else to pretend they were the one doing it <laughs> so I could legally get the compassionate friends going. But, you know, you really do need to deal with your own grief first. You need to have participated in support groups. If you haven't, you don't really understand the dynamics of how it support groups. Now that doesn't mean you had to have gone for a year, but at least gone to four or five meetings to get the feel of what a support group is. You need to understand the, the dynamics of support group, but also, and this is just my personal opinion, I think anyone that leads a support group for people that have lost someone to suicide needs some type of training in basic suicide prevention. Because invariably, you may find some of your members are suicidal. Now, they may not be ready to do it at that day, but they're going to bring it up in meetings. And if you have no training or background, you will do the best you could, but you might say or do the wrong thing unintentionally. So the better educated you can be about suicide and suicide grief, the better. You also have to understand that it is a commitment. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to do a support group and think it's going to all magically fall together and continue. You have to work out where is it going to be? How long is it going to be? When is it going to be? Are you going to be able to find a meeting place that will allow you to meet there? How are you going to publicize it? Not just once, but continuously. The group has to be nurtured. You have to show up at every meeting. You have to show up, 
Ideally, you can find another person to be a co-facilitator. Ideally, you would take some type of facilitator training at some point. Now, if you've been in a good group for a long, long time, you might not need extensive training, but otherwise you could wind up being over your head, not able to manage some of the challenges. There will be challenges at support groups. You'll have people come not only that may be suicidal, but I remember one of my early ones, a uh, man, a woman came, spent the whole time talking about how it was her ex-husband's fault that their daughter had killed herself because he was violent and abusive. Well, the next meeting, he showed up and I thought, oh Lord, what if she shows up too? <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't. But you just never know what kind of situations you may have to deal with if she had shown up because I was involved with domestic violence. I could probably have found a way to deal with it, but I did not have a co-facilitator to sort of help. So there are things like that you need to work out before you do it. Now, I don't know, and I can't speak for TSPN, but I know at one time, TSPN, Missy, we had talked about TSPN eventually hiring a professional to come in and teach support group facilitation to anybody that wanted to do it. I know I took, other than the support group facilitation I took for domestic violence, through the years I've taken quite a few. They're always refresher courses. I took the AFSP course years ago. I'd already been doing it for years, but I wanted to see what they did. And I was very, very impressed with it. I don't know how often they're still doing it or if it's evolved, but it's a commitment you've got to make. You can't just say, I want to do it a few times and then change your mind. So make sure you understand all that before you take it on. Right, and then kind of piggybacking off of that, what advice would you have for somebody who has recently lost somebody to suicide, both just in general and if they're considering joining a support group? In general, I think the suggestions that came from Lynn, Ray, and Emily were all excellent. I think we also need to remember we all grieve our own way. What works for one doesn't work for another. Our timeline is different. I've learned because I lead the parents group separate from the everybody else group, the grief of parents often is deeper and seems to last longer than the grief of other people. My FFOS group, the other friends, their support group meetings on, group, on, on Zoom aren't always support. They're just having fun. They even do sing, they had singers and things like that. They do a lot of fun. So you can't expect everybody to do it on the same timeline. Even with parents, say for example, you can't say you're going to get over it in a year or two years. You can't say, oh, she's still mourning after so many years because we don't know what other obstacles there in her life that might be keeping that person from fully grieving. Maybe the person is still raising children, supporting a family, having um, financial problems, trying to hold a job, living in domestic violence so that that person really can't grieve a lot. So six, seven years down the road, maybe that person is still grieving, whereas this one may be over it quicker. So we just kind of walk with people where they are. I remember one example of the way men and women sometimes grieve differently. One woman in the group was fuming because she said, she had just found out her husband, her son had killed himself. And what does her husband do? He says, I think I'm going to go out and mow the lawn. 
<laughs> he's, been, he's dead and he wants to move along. But what she later realized, he was one that his grief it was active. He needed to do something. And in his mind, he was thinking, people come over, the yard looks bad. That's something I can do. Um, making a garden, some people make a garden. But anyway, back to the support groups. I think support groups are wonderful. I think a lot of people don't appreciate the value of them. The fact that every support group I've ever known of is also free is wonderful. So I do want to point out support group is different from therapy though. People go, when people need, have grief needs over and beyond just regular grief, they might need to go to a counselor, to a therapist, to a professional her evaluation that is different in a support group we offer support we want with the person that is not the same that they will get in with a professional so and they don't need to think of it that way so you know whatever works for people support group works for a lot the email support group works for a lot but it's not for everyone did I answer what you asked? Did I get answer what you? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe we're going. Can't hear you. Yes, you're you're cutting in and out a little bit uh, for me, anyways. Um, oh. oh, okay. To have some questions in the chat chat if anybody wants to put in, um, if anybody has any questions uh, that they want to ask, and we, and we can try to cover those. I see one that says, could peer support group specialist. I don't know what a peer support group specialist is, but you know, I don't know what that is. Lindsay, you can speak to that. Right, so Certified Peer Recovery Specialist is a certification for individuals that have lived experience in mental health or substance misuse or both. Oh, that's um, for... And so I think... Yeah, I think that the certification allows individuals to be obviously certified and sometimes even employed in certain places that hire certified peer recovery specialists. And the model is to have um, people that understand that have walked the walk, that have personal experience that can talk to someone and kind of counsel someone through um, different things. They're not official counselors, they're not therapists, but they do have stories that they can share with individuals. So um, when it's saying, can peer support specialists do this? I'm assuming Brian's question would be, could peer support specialists be involved in facilitating groups or being a part of support groups? Well, right. yeah, I guess if it, he's talking about People that are suicidal is where that specialist comes in. But I mean, I don't see why not. Well, the legal issue would be whether you, you have someone that has a mental health license as a supervisor. Oh, um, when you're leading up, I guess I, the groups I'm leading, I've always led as a peer. I don't have a degree in it. I have a degree in that master's degree in education I've got taking a lot of courses but when it's peer that's a volunteer you're not paid volunteers are always held to different standards than professionals is that what you were asking it's 
seems that Brian is muted, but I think you answered it well. Um, so I don't know if there are any additional questions that you guys might have for either uh, Ms. Carroll or for any of the panelists that we had today. Are there any additional questions? Hi, um, can I chime in? Can everybody hear me? Absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Michelle. Um, Bauer from the Tennessee Army National Guard, the Suicide Prevention Coordinator, and also I run um, the Survivors of Suicide Loss um, programs at Family and Children's Service. So we facilitate two groups now through Zoom, and we're going to, once we get in person, are going to keep one on Zoom still um, because of just the different um, aspect of that or if people need extra support during the week. But to answer the question of being a facilitator, I used to feel weird about it because when I had started facilitating groups many years ago, I hadn't really lost anybody to suicide that I was really close to. Um, since then I have, and I had a sister who attempted suicide, um, but she survived. Um, so it's, it's kind of made that change, but you don't have to be, um, like, like Carol was saying, um, any kind of uh, special degree or anything to facilitate. Um, they do recommend that you are survivor too, been through your grief for, um, two years and, by through your grief is getting help for your grief um have went through that process um but anybody who's willing and able to work with folks that are survivors and provide that compassion and that care and willing to get trained because you're there as a facilitator it's not in a clinical way per se um so you just need to know the resources where if you feel someone is suicidal that you know where to, to direct them to or help them to get to. Um, so to answer that question, a little bit more information on that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, sure. We also had a, a question come through the chat and Carol, if you want to share just very briefly, if someone wants to add a loved one to the memorial wall or the memorial quilt, what's the process like for that? The easiest way, I, yeah, I saw that and just put my email address in the chat. Send a note to me, an email to me, Carol of Columbia at cs.com, and let me know which you're interested in or both, and I can send the directions. There is no charge for the quilt. Ronnie and I just, I mean, the quilt isn't terribly expensive. I, Ronnie and I just pay for it and donate it to TSPN every year, memory of Arlen, so there's no charge. For the wall, if you want a memorial tile, we do, it is a $5 charge for the wall tile. Some people want a duplicate for themselves, and that is $10 extra. Um, we're getting ready, since we're getting ready to move, now is a good time to get a memorial tile if you want it on the wall. You can use the same picture on the quilt and the wall if you want to, or different if you want both. I know last year, or, or the year before, when we had just moved it over, people were, from Tennessee at least, were saying, Quilt and wall both, <laughs> but I mean, you, you don't have to, but it's easier for me to just send the directions than you to have to go to the website and then communicate with me. As far as the photo, it should be a good, clear picture of the person. If the person has other people in, we crop them out. We don't put pets and things in. We don't put them hugging their children in. P, I understand those pipe pictures are meaningful, but it's the focus on the person. But we crop out whatever's not needed anyway. So, um, you know, and then we're getting the quilt ready right now. 
So this is the right time if you're interested or spread the word for people to get added to either or both. And Carol, one more time, can you remind us the cost of the tile for the wall? Uh, the wall tile is $5. Technically, they charge me almost 9 but people sometimes donate money. So we just set it at 5 That way, nobody can say, I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants a duplicate, an extra copy, and that's optional, $10 for the duplicate. Now, that means 15 I have people send me $10 and say it's for both. No, <laughs> 15 And I will mail the duplicate to the person. They give me their email address. And we do, do take PayPal. That direction is on the um, directions for anybody that wants it. And also just to kind of tell you guys something that we're working on in moving the wall um, we are looking at instead of fixing the tiles to the wall, we're going to be trying to put the tiles within photo frames, large poster frames, so that the wall could be mobile. Because you guys saw the, the large gymnasium that had all of the displays of the quilts in that one photo. But one thing that we want to do is also be able to let the wall travel. Um, so that's going to be something that we're working on as an agency is to make it such that the wall can be mobile as well. So um, like Carol said, this is a great time to get your loved one put on the wall or on the quilt for this year. Um, and again, Carol, thank you so much for all that you have been doing for um, the wall, for the quilt project. And um one other question, where can we donate? Um, if there is a, a place that donations can be sent to, Carol, would you mind sending that information in the chat box? We, we don't take donations. We never have. As a matter of fact, well, people, before we moved the wall, people had donated to POS, the parents group, that would come to retreats, and we would use that to cover the cost of the tiles. For especially for people of other countries. We couldn't see make them convert currency for a $5 bill, <laughs> you know, so we would do that. But once the wall got moved, I sent whatever little money we had left and added some to it to, T to TSPN as a donation to TSPN. The difference from the $5 to the cost of the wall tile, we just pay I mean, it's only a few dollars <laughs> and any money we spend on any of this is money we say, we just spend it on Orlin if she were here. So, I mean, we don't worry about that. So, but thanks for the thought. Um, Carol, you are extremely kind and very generous for giving not only of your time, but also of your finances to bless people in that way. So thank you. Um, if you are wanting to make a donation to TSPN, since we are, um, you know, in the process of putting the walls together and making it mobile and whatnot, you absolutely can do that. Um, if you want to email me, I can get you set up with the individual who will take the funds for any donations. My email is lcar at tspn.org. I just put that into the chat box. So feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in donating to TSPN for that cause. Um, again, I appreciate you guys being on this call today. It is 12 o'clock, so I do want to respect everyone's time. Um, but I know some of you are wondering, am I going to get a certificate of attendance for participating today? And if that is you, um, absolutely, we will be working on that. But just be patient with us because we've had quite a few people attend today. So um, just hang tight and we'll get those certificates of attendance that we'll have to contact hours for participating in the event today. So thank you guys so, so much. Um, one last thing that we're gonna do before we end today is um, blow out the candles. They have been burning our entire meeting today. So we just wanna make sure that we get those blown out. But again, huge thank you 
to the panelists that spoke, to Carol Chastain Veal for sharing about survivor groups, the memorial wall, and the memorial quilts. Um, we appreciate you guys so, so much. And if you have any need of support at all after hearing the stories today, if you are wanting to talk to somebody, we'd be more than happy to do that with you guys, more than happy to support you in any way that we can. I've already had some of you reaching out to me personally and to some of the panelists. Thank you for being honest about your stories. Um, any way that we can help you or support you, please let us know. So thank you for attending today. We're gonna to blow out the candles and you guys can hop off the meeting. So thank you. And thank you, Lindsay and Michaela for organizing this. I think you did an outstanding job. Thank you yes, guys so much. Cheryl, thank you so much.